Okay, cool. So let's get started, Tracy. I okay, so I assume, uh, Josh, you just uh, muted yourself, but I assume everybody can still hear me. Whoops, yeah, sorry, so, go ahead. So, okay, <laughs> so welcome everyone to um, Tales from the Branches, which I think is a hilarious um, <laughs> title, uh, and a discussion about GitOps uh, in the wild or in the real world. Uh, I think that we've all started talking about GitOps. It was a pretty heavy conversation last year it kind of died off but i think it's that people are starting to, to actually implement it and we're still having conversations about it and people still want to know what it is and it's oftentimes confused with other things like devops so i think the way we're going to start this is i think well i'll have the panel introduce themselves and tell us what they think um uh, GitOps is what a definition is i will start off i am tracy reagan i am the ceo of a little startup called the play hub we are in the business of managing um, a, a microservice architecture through a catalog. And yes, we are looking at integrating and providing a GitOps solution around that catalog. And when I think about GitOps, I think I really, when I define it, uh, or when people ask me what it is, I try to make it simple. It is um, production by pull request. And on that note, I am going to pass it on to the panel. Why don't we go with uh, uh, Edgar? Why don't you introduce yourself? And then you can pick somebody to introduce themselves and give us a definition of what GitOps is. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Tracy. Well, uh, hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for attending. I'm Edgar McGanna. I'm a senior principal engineer at Splunk. I've been in the company for almost a year now. I've been in... Um, different SaaS companies. My role is always around <clears throat> operations, DevOps. That includes uh, <clears throat> Salesforce and Worthy. And um, well, GitOps. Uh, for me, GitOps is just about the words. A new development experience for managing applications in the cloud for mostly CI CD pipelines, all from a source of truth, which is Git. And that's the part that I love the most. Having finally one single point for defining your resources that are going to be declarative in the cloud. So that's the shorter definition that I can come up with the GitOps. And uh, well, we have a lot of time to discuss what that means. So I'm going to pass to uh, Christopher. Hello, um, I'm Christopher Lane. I'm a senior principal um, team leader with the Enterprise Architecture Group um, at Chick-fil-A. Um, I'm primarily focused on customer um, technology solutions, uh, which is all customer facing applications and services um, at Chick-fil-A, including the, the Chick-fil-A One mobile app um, and associated digital experience back end. Um, DXC, that back end is a, is a, a cloud based microservice architecture um, and deployment to it is entirely um, GitOps based um, and has been. Uh, for about three years now. Um, so uh, all, all, de all developers on DXC um, deploy their code that way every single day um, with no formal blockout periods. Uh, for get GitOps for us, we, we follow, this is the definition we've been using in some of our blog posts and um, talks here and there, but um, it's a pattern for managing uh, the state of uh, Kubernetes cluster using Git as the source of truth. Um, so the entire state is declared and manifests in the Git repo. Um, and any changes to the state um, are then applied with a state reconciler, so Argo or Flux, um, uh, to automatically sync those changes into the cluster. You want to and pass I, it off? Yeah, uh, Sabah. Is it me? Yes. Okay, all right. All right, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening up on where you are. Uh, first of all, Tracy and Josh, thanks for hosting us. Uh, this is good. It's the beginning of, uh, we need these kind of sessions for these kind of topics. Um, I'm Srinivas Perry. Um, uh, I'm a director of engineering for Adobe. Um, and um, I'm part of a Adobe Cloud Foundation group. Um, and it is called Ethos. Um, and we do have some uh, public blogs. And then recently we also gave a talk about what, but I'll put some link here for your reference. Uh, my role specifically uh, in Adobe is uh, uh, managing the frictionless engineering. Uh, when we say frictionless engineering to 5,000 plus developers of Adobe, when they come in all the way from writing the code, taking our code to the cloud, that's the kind of a journey that uh, uh, we kind of manage and manage the experience around that. 
um, regarding GitOps, um, I kind of uh, can say it in uh, two different uh, uh, tracks, right? One is if you're already a Kubernetes shop, if you're already using Kubernetes, um, then GitOps is a no brainer because uh, you probably are juggling with uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, Kubernetes files all over and you need to put them at some place and you need to apply them on a constant basis to your um, uh, things. That's exactly what uh, GitOps is a match made in heaven uh, for enabling the first level developer experience for uh, Kubernetes. Uh, but I want to kind of say uh, GitOps is beyond Kubernetes. I mean, it applies very well to other systems as well. As long as you are able to declaratively say what your system is and define that source of truth uh, in a Git, then there's a lot of power in the principles that we have there and uh, it, it can go places. So it, we are we are planning to apply it for a lot more other places as well. So yeah. And what is not GitOps is it's not a role or a team. Please don't forget. Uh, let me pass it on to uh Surgeon. Surgeon. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Uh, I'm Sergio Patan. I'm the head of uh, DevOps at uh, Leandro, right? Um, GitOps for us, it's, uh, I mean, we had a lot of time to think about it. We, we had some conferences. We started early. We are now in the process of writing a CNCF case study about our journey. So we, we have time to process it. And the way we define GitOps for us, it's a conversational model, basically. Um, we see it as a software release collaboration platform. Uh, as a place where all the parties have to be, like the software engineers, infrastructure engineers, testing, security, business owners, compliance, and audit professionals, they all have to be present on this on this communication platform because they have to be part of how we release code, fast, reliable, and, and uh, yeah, that's essential for us to serve our customers. Uh, it brings a lot of benefits. So far, we are extremely happy. You know, as, as working in a financial sector, you have a lot of auditing happening, a lot of compliance. And uh, once you have the GitOps, everything, it, it's uh, so easy. I mean, the conversation is really, really simplified. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for introducing yourselves. As you can see, we have an amazing uh, group of, of individuals who are actually using GitOps in, in the wild. Um, one of my common questions that I get is why, why would you move to a GitOps model? Um, I know that in terms of when you think about the CI CD pipeline and I, it's my soapbox, so I have to stand on it just for a minute. We, as a community has, we've kind of failed in really defining a, a very solid repeatable deployment process. Um, so I know that's one of the primary drivers for GitOps, but I want to know from each individual, and I think that uh, Srinivas, you started talking about uh, what, what one of your drivers was for adopting GitOps, but can you just kind of expand on what you were, you were talking about um, in terms of why you went to a, a GitOps model? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I think I, I can go uh, cover a little bit of a history as well, right? So over the last decade at Adobe, as you all can imagine, as a part of our motor subscription and the cloud. Um, we have a lot of AWS accounts and then we are also multi-cloud. We have so many cloud accounts and then um, uh, so many people did so many different ways to be able to deliver the software, right? And the right. business goals are achieved. While we are doing all of those things, uh, uh, we came up with our first generation of, uh, uh, we call it as a service delivery, uh, CICD, we kind, of, we kind of call it the service delivery platform. Um, we came up with our first version of a, uh, 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 CI CD, which actually is uh, uh, even before the Kubernetes days, right? I think BCOS is the first one we kind of started with, and we had our own opinionated uh, CI CD, and we applied it to Kubernetes clusters. And when it was time to transition from uh, DCOS to Kubernetes, uh, uh, we actually used the same CI CD uh, solution to be able to shift to that because it was homegrown, it has an abstraction around it, and then it's a great success for us. Um, uh, but I think once we have a Kubernetes in place, then the, all the power, uh, the, the world has moved on in the last five, five years with respect to where we were, right? I think now uh, with respect to, uh, if you think about the CICD requirements, machine learning and AI and all the pipelines related it, and we have a platform, some uh, building on top of platforms which demand a lot more requirements that were not met with the current system. 
Uh, and similarly, there are a lot of collaborative apps. We need a lot of different use cases and then current opinion system is not working for them, right? And the same, if you think about edge and data related applications and all that. Uh, so there were definitely uh, some 30% of the use cases that we have for today. I think our current CSD already has a thousands of services used by a lot of people. It, it's all glass is half full, right? I mean, that's all great in way. With respect to glass half empty, that's where we have to uh, innovate our next solution, which is native to Kubernetes. When I had to think about what is something that we can do, given that we have experience of so much of doing, how, how can you do the better, better 2.0, right? We definitely started looking around what's out there. And then that's where um, we looked at a uh, lot of activity happening out there and the GitOps and the, all the tools around it. So we kind of did our, uh, we usually our hackathon twice, do our hackathon twice a year, last year around, um, uh, March uh, time frame. We did our hackathon. With, let's let's see what's out there, right? And then we did our hackathon. It came out really well, and that's how we were able to kind of invest on it. Uh, as we speak, uh, we have a very active project right now um, uh, with respect to rolling out an offering uh, based on a GitOps. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about GitOps alone will not solve anything, but it is a very big part of what we are doing, and uh, um, it it will it will go live in production in the coming uh, uh, months. Yeah, we are in still early stages from that perspective, but uh, I'm already excited about what this brings to the table and what ROI we can have. And Edgar, how about, why don't you pitch in there? What, uh, what was the drivers uh, for your teams to really take a look at GitOps and move sure, into sure. that? Sure, uh, sure. Thanks, Faisy. Uh, but very similar experience, right? Whether you are a company who was born in the cloud or a company that is moving to the cloud, you, whether you want it or not, you organically grow in the cloud with multiple accounts, like people start building the clusters and, you know, all the, all the public clouds, they have the version of Kubernetes. And it's a couple of APIs that you have a Kubernetes cluster up and running and people start deploying applications and they get excited. And then they look at the development platform tools or the development or the DevOps uh, teams in the organization and like, uh, we're really excited with this shiny new thing, please run it for us. And then, um, and then you have 20, 30, 40 different things doing their own thing in the cloud. So I think GitOps is a solution to finally have a centralized point of uh, management for all these applications, trying to converge everything into one way to manage things. It's a solution for a problem that I guarantee 99 of the companies are going through. It happens in my last two uh, companies. It's happening here at Splunk. We're growing drastically, and and GitOps is giving us a reduction of complexity for managing that uh, those those applications in the cloud. And finally, given the CD experience, a lot of people ask me like continuous delivery or continuous deployment. How often is that? And my answer like, whenever you're ready. I mean, it's, all day long. <laughs> exactly, like continuous, <laughs> right? You're ready. I should be ready. Right, maybe one final approval for compliance. We all know go through that, right? But it should be able to be deployed in whatever target, in whatever cloud, multi-region, multi-sale, whatever your architecture, regardless of you know what is your pipeline. So that's that's for me the definition of uh, of the CD. And GitOps is, is is giving you that, right? And uh, you mess up, happens. Security vulnerability, whatever, rollbacks instantaneously. You don't need to apply for a new MR, things like that. You can actually have processes to roll back in place. Um, we can we can talk about the SLS and SLOs as uh, as the conversation keeps going. And you are wearing an Argo hoodie, so I assume that you're using Argo CD. <laughs> and I had the Argo. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Making me so comfortable. I want to ask a question to the two of you then before we move on to our next question is. In your process, did you implement any kind of uh, IAC first, like Terraform or Rancher? Did you do that before you did? You uh, addressed uh, an operator kind of method for application deployments. I can did continue you, and then pass to. Um, oh. Did you use like in, in, in for example at Splunk? Did you guys start with using um, infrastructure as code as a model? Uh, and it, did that help you get to using um, an operator uh, infrastructure for doing deployments of applications? Yes. Unfortunately, Terraform is another beast, right? Uh, everybody has their own version of Terraform and it's, it's happening very similar, right? There are people building uh, some layers of the infra that they use their own Terraform. 
Uh, everybody started with the, the default Terraform models and then expanded for their own needs. And, and then you need some kind of uh, an orchestration system to actually run that Terraform, uh, make sure that the state is safe and then and coming back. And uh, we're doing that, that work of kind of like also merging all these different Terraform uh, models uh, all over the place, creating kind of like an aggregated of, I don't like to call it monolithic, but like one centralized repo where all these Terraform models will be used by individual pipelines to actually create the resources that they need. And I think the important part is to give the development teams the full ownership of the infra that they need for their applications to run in the cloud. Because if you break it down into two processes, I build the infra and you, and you deploy the application, even that I've given you the tools, then you have to do service discovery, the service discovery for the resources, upon secret management became a dimer. But if you have a streamlined pipeline, that's actually way more productive in my opinion. Great. So when we talk about things, these new technologies, we always have to, um, you know, show them off with all their glorious warts as well <laughs> and the gotchas. So I think the question is, and I'll pass this off to um, Sergio, what, what were some of the um, challenges that you, uh, that kind of showed up while you, while you were implementing GitOps? What kind of challenges did your teams have to overcome? Uh, whew, yes, uh, a lot of them, obviously. It's not an easy journey, especially if you wanna like do it right. Uh, I guess what, what we did right from the beginning was really had, the, the, had to challenge everything that uh, we knew about our technology stack. We, we sat down and said, okay, where are we exactly? What is the, the landscape? Which tool are we using? Which are we comfortable to? Which can we improve? You know? And then we made the roadmap and, and we painted the, uh, the projection of the future. We looked and said, okay, this is where we want to be. And then doing that, uh, we, we realized that to get to that place, you know, that, that good place that we want to be soon, um, we have to pitch the cost to our management. You know? So um, I guess it's important to start the conversation, the, the whole organization uh, discussion early on. You, know, you go to management, you pitch for, for a budget to achieve what you have. But then, of course, you have to sell the benefits of it. So uh, you have to make your homework very well. And to do that, you need to have different POCs uh, running in your own stack and you own the infrastructure. So why not, for example, deploy Argo and uh, make sure that all your, your infrastructure as a code, it's actually uh, run as a, in a GitOps model. No? So you, you run it small for one team and then you prove the, the sustainability of that. And with those results, you can go to the development teams, you, know, you, you pitch your idea, your, your way of working, you go to management and then you say, okay, that, that would be the budget, but hold on, you know, we can do much more than just GitOps. We now is the chance to uh, revisit our infrastructure. And that's essential now because most of us already are running on, on a legacy system. Legacy can mean like three months old, 10 years old. And that has to be challenged. I mean, is that infrastructure capable, good enough to sustain what I'm trying to achieve? And if not, then uh, I know step one, one uh, uh, step behind you and, and uh, redesign it, evaluate it. Uh, uh, so that that all that that conversation and all that investment was really really important for us. Uh, and then of course the next question is who's going to build that, who's going to operate that, and how can uh, we create, uh, uh, how can we gravitate the whole conversation around the team that owns all the tools that, that have been created? So you need a strong team for that, a team that is capable of, of uh, collaborating and deciding the future uh, and have some tough conversation. You know, uh, Some of the engineers might have been invested in the previous decisions. So the team has to be really well working and very well assembled. Um, uh, so that's also something very important for you to consider. Do you have the capacity for that? Do you have the knowledge? If you don't have the knowledge, okay, how do we achieve the knowledge in the short and medium term? So, uh, that's that's extremely important. Um, well, did you find I, when you when you went to uh, go through this process? I realized the cultural shift is pretty big. Did you get any pushback with, with having to have an operator running in every cluster? Were, were production teams concerned about having that kind of uh, having that kind of change to a production cluster? 
pushback no no there was some resistance uh, with the timeline obviously uh, because uh, you know you have to deliver business value and that's the the main uh, focus of the team so especially the developers team uh, and how can you uh, do that you know and have an ambitious agenda while also taking uh, the time to reassess uh, all your technology stack and change the way you are working so that was the the biggest um, i would say friction that we had other than that, we were really amazed to see that everybody was hungry for for the novelty of doing it. So everybody was curious. Everybody was jumping in in the conversation early on. The management that were like really happy to 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 really invest in something that they felt is going to bring a lot a lot of value, especially on as I was mentioning early on the on the on the governance uh, and also on the compliance, but also on the security. Now we had a chance to shift security left, shift uh, quality left. You know shift uh, compliance left so the benefits were quite obviously uh, defined for everybody i would say we, we were really good just the timeline was was a little bit uh, hard to, to sustain yeah. and christopher why don't you why don't you jump in there what are the, some of the benefits that you guys immediately saw once you went through all the pain getting it going got got through the cultural shift understood what your drivers were what were some of the immediate benefits that you that your team saw so you know one of the one of the primary benefits we saw almost immediately was uh, increased developer pr productivity. So we implemented all of our GitOps processes in GitHub Actions as well. And originally they were in Jenkins, but we switched over to GitHub Actions. Um, and so developers actually have a single pane of glass that they can go to to sort of see everything that's going on um, from pushing their code um, and uh, to the actual deployment of it. It's all happening kind of in one. Uh, one setting. So that helped tremendously because it was just fewer tools uh, for folks to traverse every single day. And that's a lot of feedback we have. There's a lot of tooling out there. There's a lot of things to look at. And so if you can eliminate those, uh, some of those day-to-day, -day, really hour-by-hour -hour, uh, panes of glass that um, developers and teams are looking at, that helps uh, tremendously. Um, I'd also say there was a, a lot of uh, increased consistency and standardization. There was some initial pushback, I'd say, from letting some of these things go. So you mentioned the operator, uh, you know, we use external DNS heavily, which manages Route 53 entries for us. Uh, some of that was a, a little bit of, I'm not sure I wanna let this go. And is this operator going to do exactly what I think it's gonna do at all the times? So there was definitely a little bit of uh, burn in and say, hey, these things are actually working. It's better for all of these different reasons to let some of this go. But once we got past that initial hump, Everything is uh, configured um, through, through KH Manifest and YAML. Now, complaints about YAML aside, it does centralize uh, folks. You go to one place, um, the cluster is defined in a Git repo, we call it an atlas. So you go to the atlas um, and you use one config language, YAML, uh, to configure everything. And uh, I think that helps from just a consistent standardization. Again, you're asking folks to context switch less, which is it boosts uh, productivity. Um, and then reliability. Um, so because all of the deployment processes just look like regular Git processes, almost anybody can revert um, a bad deployment, right? And get back into a, a healthy state pretty quickly. Um, so if you think about us, we have a tremendous amount of traffic coming through right at the launch peak. Uh, we do not have blackout periods, but if something goes bad with a deployment, we can almost instantly revert back with just within a few uh, minutes, generally even seconds to get back to a healthy state. Um, and so that, that has helped open up the pipelines for support and um, just being able to get back into a good state quickly uh, and efficiently. Interesting. So, you know, we're about halfway through this. Um, let me open it up to the, uh, the, 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 the attendees here. If anybody has a question, we do like to pretend as if we're all in the same room. This is a meetup. So please, if you have a question, just unmute yourself or raise your hand um, or post it in the, the chat and we'll be happy to, um, to address it. I uh, don't know if there's any questions out there right now that we should be looking at. Yeah, we have a couple in the Q&A box there, Tracy. Okay, I don't know <laughs> yeah. if I, why I can't see the Q&A box. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we have one here from Engine 2 He has um, how and do you uh, handle long-term metrics. Uh, that one might have gotten we, answered. We use Thanos. Um, so Thanos Operator actually, which is uh, running alongside Prometheus Operator, 
Um, and we um, we put them all into to S3. So we use Thanos heavily. And then do you and have yeah. any, yeah, they're asking, he's asking also about policy as code. Um, do you have any kind of um, rules uh, uh, for the devs, the dev teams? Uh, so we do, uh, we're trying to get more into that. We do use the, um, you know, OPA to write uh, admission controllers um, into the cluster. So we have some of those around our change management process because we want um, those tickets to flow through into the, the spot that the help group is looking for. Um, and we're actively looking to write more of those kinds of admission type controllers. Um, so those are kind of the policy based things we have now. Yeah, I think, you know, when we talk about it could be a whole different topic, right? Um, yeah. I think uh, policies are going to be important as we move forward. And we automate more if we can define the policies in a more strict way and automate that part of it. <laughs> I think we can get away with that and not have so many uh, manual approvals. It'd be nice not to have to do manual approvals and uh, approve commits. It'd be nice to have it just go through based on policies. Um, so let's just let's keep on moving here. So, you know, kind of on the other side of the coin, uh, once you've started implementing this, um, Edgar, Edgar, why don't you give us an idea of what some of the challenges and the gotchas you might have found after you initially implemented and what you had to do to get through them. One of the common things I hear that people tell me is that there's a lot of mer uh, they have merge issues and there's a lot of branches. Um, what, could you reflect on that at all? Yes, um, so challenges. Uh, first of all, we need to do a lot of evangelization internally in the company, right? Uh, GitOps, uh, people, sometimes they don't get it. So we need to, you know, explain. We went through, you know, a lot of demos. Uh, take it one step at a time, right? Changing uh, from a full declarative methodology. Uh, it wasn't that easy. And then uh, once people get excited about it and, and see the advantages, then we went through the next level, which is like, what's going to be your access model, please uh, walk me through your RBAC, right? Uh, because now you're telling me that you're gonna change uh, something in your uh, Git code and then you are rolling out in production. That scares a lot of uh, people in the company, right? Especially compliance and security. Uh, fortunately, we have a very strong uh, access model. Uh, we have, as you mentioned, uh, development branches and uh, rollout uh, branches. So. Internally, we use GitLab and it gives, uh, give us the right connection uh, with the Argo tools to actually enforce for only limited amount of people, the ability to do a merge after some checks and obviously all the CI pipelines, et cetera, to go um, all the way to production. We also have OPA policies to connect with the previous question. Um, it's not uh, fully enforced in all the pipelines yet, but that's our goals, right? So we're gonna have OPA policies to guarantee that only specific persons are able to do the merge and, and the final rollout to production clusters. Um, other challenges, um, the, the merging happened when we did the transition for uh, some of the development branches into the new kind of like repo structure for um, the rollouts. Uh, some of the, some of the uh, development teams didn't really have a uh, well-structured um, uh, pipelines there. So we're helping them to get into that transition. And it's not easy because um, you want to implement an homogeneous kind of like pipeline to connect with your CI and then do your CD, right? Regardless of the backend technology that you're using or open source project, et cetera, right? Um, every single team uh, will implement their own thing, right? Some of them, they may even call Cube commands directly, so now they use an operator, and I keep going, right? It's very hard to have a homogeneous system if you're not starting from scratch. If you have the opportunity, if you're attending this panel and you're an architect and you have the opportunity to have a green fill, make sure that you do the cookie coded, uh, cookie -coded process for the um, CD pipelines because it's gonna make your life way easier in the future. But if you don't have it, the challenge is was to do that transition. Um, sometimes we have to do like hand holding one service team at a time. So, but once you're done with the transition, you're done, and and things you know became way easier to operate for uh, for your SRE teams. So, Nivas, what about you? You guys have a pretty big environment. What kind of challenges did you run into after you kind of got this rolling? What were the tweaks? Yeah. So, what interesting thing is uh, 
we are still in the process of implementing this part. So I think we have an existing system, which is large, but the new system is not that much. So some of this is a great learning that we can take and apply it back. But I think the way I kind of uh, uh, look at things is, uh, I think starting is it's hard, right? I mean, when we talk about the crops, I mean, we, we have to be clear on there are three things going on here, right? One is infrastructure, the other is application, the other is everything else beyond compute, like our services that you're talking about, right? So probably we don't want to start with all of them. It looks like Edgar, some of the stuff that you're talking about, you guys have a, a good story on uh, at least two of them, right? I'm, I'm hearing, uh, which is great. I think as far as we are concerned, at this point, we are heads down, focusing on the service delivery first, right? I mean, that is where most of our energy is. Um, and just to touch on, uh, the operator as a thing which you Tracy, you uh, you asked a couple of times right um, I think these clusters and uh, as the clusters grow big and big and big updating the clusters and managing and maintaining the kubernetes clusters is a huge amount of effort right so ha not having a dependency on the cluster is a big deal so I think the way we are architecting is uh, we are not putting our uh, git gitops engine, a controller, whatever you want to call it as, not in the cluster, but as a hub and spoke model. So it's in the outside uh, the clusters and this will go and connect and all of it and all of it. And we'll develop our own SDLC kind of a model to be able to update this hub cluster, right? So those are the, some of the things that uh, we are applying as we go along because we are multi-tenant, multi-cloud and all those kinds of things. And we need to connect a lot of those places. Yeah. That's interesting. I've, I think I've heard other kind of references to having that kind of hub and spoke um, model uh, for the operator. It's one of why I asked. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot to there's a lot to unpack in that in that particular conversation, right? We could talk about that for a while, I think. Um, let's go to the next question that I often get, and that is how do you manage your repos? Um, Christopher, can you give us a kind of an idea of maybe how you guys really structured repos? Do you have separate ones for dev test and prod? Do each team have one? How many do you have an environment repo separate from the code repo? Yeah, so um, uh, so I mentioned before, we, we call the Git repo that stores the uh, state of the cluster in Atlas internally. Um, we yeah. have a significant amount of internal conversations about right sizing our clusters. Um, we end up landing with clusters at the audience level. And so um, you can think a customer audience. So there's a dedicated set of clusters for the customer team that, that we manage. Um, there's another another set of cluster for the staff audience, another for the operator audience. But we went through several iterations about trying to get that right. Uh, I think it does depend on the the organization a little bit about getting it right. But we didn't want to go too small. That creates maintenance problems. You lose a lot of the you know the economy of scale. Uh, but we didn't want to have too big and have like sort of this one giant um, centralized cluster either. Um, so we went through several iterations. Um, actually built some of those and deployed them to get it right. Um, and so that's where we ended up, but I think it does depend on the org a little bit. Um, the Atlas is uh, separated per um, environment per region. So there's a branch for each one of those. So think dev slash US East one, that's our dev cluster in US East one, dev US West two, so forth, QA, um, US East one. Um, so we have a, a branch for environment per region like that. Um, and that stores the, the entire state. Um, we have built up a little tooling around that that um, will log into the account, sort of scrape everything out of the account we need, um, and then generate the manifest that uh, goes along with it for updating um, the, the core component manifests. Um, so there definitely is some tooling there. There's always some uh, templated variables that you need to get like right at the last minute. <laughs> um, and so, so we did have to build up a little tooling around that. In theory, things like Helm um, and some other tools will, will do some of that for you. Um, we, we found that we still needed a little bit extra internal tooling to make those completely work seamlessly um, for us. But um, but yeah, gener generally speaking, uh, the, the dev environments are kind of the wild west. People can, can commit to those and make changes to them. But as you progress up, uh, it gets more and more locked down. Um, and so prod, uh, changing, core components of a, a product cluster requires a PR um, and approval from um, e either someone um, in my group or uh, one of the lead engineers um, to actually get those changes in. Uh, we tend to use bottle rocket nodes for patching and things like that and managing them. 
Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's how we manage those um, clusters internally uh, in terms of getting the manifests um, set for the actual environment. I think it's interesting you mentioned Atlas. You have one behind you, first of all. Yes, I do. You know, when we, when, you know, we have an open source project that's incubating at the Linux Foundation. And it's called Artilius. Um, and yeah. Artilius was, Abraham Artilius created the first world atlas. And we used that name because we were, you know, mapping clusters, right? Yeah. And creating mm -hmm. a, a central, central location to see all of those maps. So I, I think it's interesting that you, you termed it atlas because we kind of see it as the same kind of the same, yeah. it, it, that's what we're, we need to do. We need to be able to see where everything's running. We need to have good visibility. Uh, I would if not observability, let's not confuse it with that, but good visibility into how to get back to a, a, a stable state and what the changes are over time. Um, and I, I think that's what we're really talking about here when we really talk about GitOps. Sergio, what, yeah. what are your thoughts? Maybe, on how maybe, to... maybe can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. So, Christopher, when, when you say at least it, it's one of your uh, in-home uh, project that you take all the configurations from the gate and then you kind of show it. Is that what it is? Uh, so it, it's nothing fancy. It's just to, to reference. It's just a regular old Git repo, but it's just the, we, we call them Atlas to distinguish them from other uh, kinds of repos. Um, but it, uh, it, all Atlases store the state of some cluster. Uh, it came, we also run a cluster in every single restaurant. Um, and that was really a lot of what was driving. Uh, we needed, it, when you have that and it's hard to get down into the restaurant and hard to make changes if something goes wrong. So you really do at that point need to start declaring the state of all of them. Um, uh, you know, we're managing 2,600 plus clusters and growing just at the restaurant level. Um, and so that's where you really need it. So we, we didn't need a term for referring to those. Um, and so that's where it came up. There's nothing particularly um, fancy about it, um, okay. but uh, but yeah. yeah. It's still a Git, the interface is still Git. Yes, it it. yeah, it's just a regular old Git repo. Okay, uh, funny enough, we also have a code name at last some other, we refer for something else inside the yeah. project, so. <laughs> Why great, great minds think alike, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Sergio, uh, what about ahead. you? How, how do you manage your, your repositories? Do you have any? any insights and in how to make them easier well we we have a, a trunk by the development uh, which applies for um, uh, business value but also for infrastructure and regarding the the whole infrastructure as a code we have two approaches we we use either terraform with atlantis or we use helm with uh, 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 yeah with uh, argo and that's how we manage everything all the infrastructure for us goes through these two pipelines. Um, you know, maybe I'll just throw this one out to you. Is there, um, were your, you know, operation teams are oftentimes what I like to call risk averse. Um, was there any like extra education you needed to go through to get your production control team sort of accepting this model? Uh, the, the, the cultural uh, shift that is required for this type of a, a deployment process is pretty, pretty vast. Um, did you have any thoughts on how to get production teams to embrace this? In a, in a, I know upper management is important, but production is the ones we have to make happy. <laughs> so did you have any, idea, any yeah. thoughts on that? The question was for me, I was like, miss the, the, the target of the question. Um, <clears throat> yes, I mean, uh, there are so many benefits that, that you can sell, right? Uh, first of all, if you do everything right, you have unlimited potential to improve yourself. Uh, and that implies also how you operate the whole cluster, meaning that any change performed can be tested and then the, the predictability of that output is it's quite clear. So you have less incidents coming. And then once you have all the automation in place, it's so easy to turn to modern tools for dealing with incident management. You, know, uh, you have a Terraform provider for Ovgini, for example, and then you integrate Ovgini in all your observability and you have enough alerts so that you can uh, you can react faster than your customers and, and really fix the issue before it has any business value uh, uh, driven out of, of, of your processes. So once that, promise becomes a reality. I mean, everybody will simply embrace it. Uh, we had that, uh, that experience. 
So Vincat asked the question, he says, can anyone in the panel speak per from personal experience in terms of um, GitOps actual switch situation for cost efficiency, velocity, security, and resilience? I think all of you have mentioned it a bit, but is it, does anybody want to take that question on and um, kind of wrap it up? I can think about velocity uh, because it's kind of like our major concerns. Um, the organization that I represent, we provide tools uh, for the development teams to actually deliver code with security, efficiency, like, you know, uh, performance wise, et cetera, right? And sometimes uh, one of the blockers is to have the right environment for the, for running all the testing, right? Imagine that ingestion for 50 terabytes. It's not that easy to actually come up with that development environment. So we created a GitOps model to actually create ephemeral uh, testing environments in the cloud where we can actually have uh, small clusters ready to start growing as the test is requiring uh, or demanding resources uh, dynamically. You can just, you know, at scaling groups or whatever cloud configuration you have in mind. And then uh, via a CD in, in inception model. So basically the only thing that we have incepted is uh, the CD operator, in this case is Argo. And you start deploying all the dependencies for your testing, um, even your data generation, whatever is your platform, in our case, we release the, the, the Splunk the stack and anything else that you needed, right? But that will apply for a lot of companies, not just for uh, uh, observability system, for anything that you want to, to develop. So um, in a nutshell, uh, we increased uh, productivity for these development teams drastically. Um, that's an example that I can share about, the, uh, um, <clears throat> sorry, about uh, velocity, about cost efficiency, um, we have a production system also for not just the CD part, for also the CI part, which uh, also uses uh, some GitOps uh, uh, methodologies. Um, besides the RD, there is another concept for orchestration, which Argo workflows. And when you put these two things together, it's actually a very pa powerful platform. We actually replace um, very expensive uh, CI tooling for open source systems um, out there. So in our open source teams, um, all the add-ons for the Splunk platform are actually tested in the cloud for free today. That was a reduction of, I don't know, at thousands and thousands of dollars for, for our system. So um, I think uh, open, up, open up the door to a lot of cost efficiency, uh, saving tons of resources. You can actually be creative in the cloud using the, you know, different kind of like cloud instances just to reduce uh, your budget um, monthly or per year. Well, I think Christopher gets the award for having the most clusters I've ever heard of anybody managing. <laughs> That's a lot of clusters. It's not just me. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, but I, I, you know, I, so it, that's a lot of clusters. I didn't, I never it, thought about it from the retail perspective with a lot of small stores. That's, that's pretty outstanding. So we have about 10 minutes left. Um, what I'd like to do is kind of finish this off by um, going around and, and to everybody. Well, let's start with, uh, let's start with Sergio. Um, tell me something we don't know about GitOps. About GitOps, I, I can tell something interesting about how we achieved our current CI CD. Uh, and that is that it was designed by someone that never designed a pipeline before. Uh, and that was on purpose because we didn't have to have anyone biased towards Jenkins or the old way of doing it. And I have to say the, the experience was worth it. We had really a, a huge success there. As I love that. Um, we are in a phase right now when we're moving from a monolith to a microservice architecture and cloud native that our linear way of thinking about CI CD pipelines has got to be blown up. <laughs> Exactly. We have, we have yeah. to get into an, a, thinking about events and policies and, and non-linear complex systems. We have to start building solutions for that. Edgar, what is your thoughts? What, tell us something we don't know. We didn't, we didn't discuss much about security. And actually, there is a big 
improvement in security via the GitOps model. You're closing all the doors in your production clusters. You already do that, but you still have, you know, your SRE team, they go to a bastion server, they do the connection. By the way, being in that position, you know that there is an, an awful experience for the SRE team, right? Yeah. Now, you have the right observability. If you have the right uh, access model for your GitOps system, you can actually manage changes, even the booging from your source code, believe it or not. You can actually enable the booging for a system with a single MR in your safe environment, whatever is your Git repository, waiting for things to happen, changes, and start looking into your observability, and you didn't actually jump into the Bastion server. So it's more productive, it's actually reducing your time for operations in a production system, and it's more secure. So uh, if you look into the security aspect, I think that's something that uh, you know security teams will, you know, if they're not familiar with the model, they will start asking questions, but once they get familiar with the, with the model, they will actually start adopting it even, even faster because they, they will see the benefits. Christopher, your thoughts? Yeah, so um, one thing I, I do think gets skipped over a little bit with um, GitOps is uh, it's, a, it's a significant challenge um, to get the initial base manifests for both the components and your applications into Git. Now, once they're, once they're there, you can modify and you can use customize and things like that to patch them and everything. But I think sometimes we, we skip over that part. Uh, generating the initial manifest is non-trivial. Uh, Helm is there to help, but Helm charts, as we all know, can vary widely. Um, and even once you have the Helm charts, it's not at all clear sometimes what those initial values should be. Um, and so it took us a while. It, it, it's a problem, in my opinion, that requires high levels of knowledge of Kubernetes and also your application use cases. Um, and so it does require sort of broad knowledge um, to get those um, initial manifests in place. Uh, that's one thing I always like to add when I'm talking about um, uh, GitOps is just that initial getting up to speed with the manifest, whether it's the core components or sort of your base application manifests um, can be difficult. Uh, so so uh, we, we solved it by having sort of feeder repos that contain the base manifests. And then people can say, hey, I'm deploying a Java API or a Python API, and they can just reference um, those. And they just have to apply overlays so they don't have to sort of wade through this gigantic pile of YAML immediately. Um, but, uh, but, but generate them can be, can be non-trivial. Sir Nivas, what about you? Yeah, first of all, I plus one, what Christopher is saying with respect to bootstrapping it, the pain that we are <laughs> going through right now, I totally plus on that. Yeah, I think I will not tell anything new, but I think I will tell what we all knew and it is hard to grok, right? Um, this whole, uh, GitOps thing, uh, I mean, if you have to think about, um, in English, uh, if you have to kind of normally, if you have to apply it everywhere in your life, right? It is kind of like a follow follow through, right? So, uh, like previously, I have this version, go and deploy, right? We did it for the last decade and it all happened. But here, what we are saying here is I want this version to be there and all these places, right? And then there is some magic over there in the middle of the GitOps engine. Uh, it is doing the job. And it is following up a follow through. If it is not there, if it, there is a drift, it will go and fix it, right? Because good amount of the issues and all that comes because of the change. And if this guy is sitting there as a strategic weapon and helping, making sure they are not drift the change, it can bring a lot of reliability and stability and all those things to systems, especially the growing systems, right? That I think is not an easy one to grab. And once you get into that mode, then it's your current investments and your current whatever the tools that we have. We just teach them how you kind of apply to this principles, right? That actually makes the, the journey of how you talk through easy. Uh, so. Well, I will finish by saying somebody asked a, a question earlier about what's the future of GitOps. Um, you know, I'm betting that we are going to get smarter about managing what I like to call the data of DevOps. Um, we're going to get smarter about generating those initial manifest files and tracking them and changing them in an automated way and even automating the pull request so that the human side of GitOps becomes simpler. Um, and I, and I, that is probably one of the biggest things I hear people talk about is we still are st still dealing with a file-based system, even though we are checking it in to Git. And now we have a single source of truth that's reading the, oper from the operators reading from to update the system. 
but we still have humans involved in the early part. The more we can take the, the job away from humans and start generating that and tracking it in a centralized place, the better off we're all gonna be. And on that, gentlemen, I wanna thank you. There are, few, we have like a few minutes left. Josh, do we have time to take some questions from the attendees? Yeah, for sure. We actually have um, some extra time. So we can go another five minutes after um, or even 10, but I'd say another five minutes after the hour. So we got about 10 minutes to answer questions. Yeah. Okay. Great. So there was an interesting question up here. Did you guys use a GitOps manager when you went to do your implementation? Did you have one single point of contact uh, to, to push the project forward or was that yourselves? <laughs> yes, for our case, um, yeah, we did the, the, we started from the POC all the way to talking to compliance, uh, security teams, uh, and now execution and operation. So yeah, you have to build a small team to actually go through. And then uh, my recommendation is to have development teams only in their pipelines, only in their own destiny, because otherwise it's gonna be unmanageable for your uh, organization of your team. Uh, and, and the more that they own it, they are responsible from their own CI, CD part of the equation, uh, your life will just Go easy, uh, but at the beginning, yeah, we have to have holding a lot of hands. We have to have like responsible for alerts and everything, and and we're still right. We're still responsible for whatever your backend for the CD part. Uh, you still have to have like an, an operations team, you know, twenty four seven because um, I take this very serious. This is the path to production. Uh, we even have plans for high availability and disaster recovery for the CD backend because imagine that you are two weeks back and there is a log. 4J vulnerability and you want to patch all over the world and your patch production is down because you didn't plan for a high availability, then that's bad decision, right? So architecturally, think about those things and uh, focus on the, you know, um, uh, productivity of your organization and also the ability to patch at any time or roll out or whatever you want to use. So uh, another question, then I'll, I'll summarize it, but uh, is there any... Uh, applications that are not appropriate for a GitOps uh, model. Uh, and on top of that, I wanna to add to that question is, when you're pushing through, a, you have a GitOps model and you have a database update at the same time, how are you coordinating those two? So what's not a good, a, a, a good architecture or application type that might not be work for a GitOps model? I think the, mo the big monolithic applications are difficult to manage with the GitOps. Uh, most of the companies are going through that, breaking down and making it more microservice. Um, you can just suspect like, you know, switching traffic from, uh, I don't know, a monolithic application that they need to load a lot of cache um, and then, you know, waiting for a couple of hours and having your traffic or your customers stop because that's the model that you implemented. I think that's not gonna be a good model. I think uh, that's when you start using operators and other things to, you know, having a, having a different strategy. I don't know, I, I think that the big monolithic will be kind of like hard to make it happen. It, it could, but um, initially it's gonna be challenging. And what about the database? How do you guys handle database updates? Anybody wanna take, tackle that one? Call the DBAs and tell them it's going. <laughs> if we if we cannot uh, uh, able to declaratively uh, represent it, then we cannot do GitOps, right? I think that is the first thing. Can you declaratively map, do it, right? And that's the first thing. Is it, that is the first thing to say whether it's a match for GitOps or not? Because you don't want to fit everything else into GitOps, right? First, it has to be. You have to express it declaratively. Then then only we can make a point. Right. Well, even the database can be managed declaratively, though, right? It can. That's good. It can. Yes. Okay. Okay. We gotta, Once... we, gotta, we gotta bring the DBAs into the into the fold. Sometimes they're always out there on their own. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, if if that problem is solved, then I think GitOps uh, uh, for sure should apply for that as well. Yeah, because if we think about every object being a component and every component having its own deployment logic, um, you know, whether however the DBAs executing their scripts at the same time, you're getting a, 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 a commit um, for the, the new, the new um, 
uh, manifest to be checked in uh, or are approved. There's got to be a way to coordinate all those pieces. Uh, and I think that this discussion is going to become even more important as we move to poly database formats, where every microservice could have their own database, right? Or maybe four or five microservices share a database. Uh, so how I think we have to, as a community, start thinking about all the different kinds of things that we could potentially use GitOps for and how we start modeling that. Anybody thought about that yet? How about Christopher and his atlas? <laughs> Are you pushing yeah. DBAs to get that stuff in your atlas? <laughs> uh, so uh, we're um, we mostly use Dynamo uh, for, for for that, and uh, every single application pretty much has its own dedicated Dynamo DB tables um, that they manage, and so no one else um, can touch the data is streamed to. Um, a, an Aurora database uh, using the Dynamo streams uh, native integration to get like real time analytics. Um, so, so yeah, we do kind of have that set up now where there's just a dedicated uh, uh, Dynamo table per application or at least a couple of them dedicated to the application. Um, but uh, right right now the, the, the database and where we're storing state um, is outside of the, the cluster. We tend to use AWS native um, uh, technologies for that. Um, at the moment, although I do agree that everything that can be declared can go through GitOps uh, processes. So um, I'm, I'm on board with that, but we don't do that um, right now. We'll get there. We, we will get there. And then I think the last question that I have for the, um, if anybody wants to take this on, and it's probably one that's kind of a um, more obscure, but how are you managing, um, and some of you referred to how, how you might be doing it, but just overall, how are you managing all the different key value pairs for the different environments? Um, do those have to be updated in different environment uh, repos with different YAML files? Is that, and is a human doing that? Are you reading it from an Excel spreadsheet? So um, like that, that's what we use some of that last mile tooling for is to scrape it out of the AWS account. It's generally there. Um, uh, for some of the configs, we just drop a config map so that the applications can know where they are. Um, but we, we try to read as much as po possible um, that out, of the, um, out of the AWS account um, settings. Uh, so we do have uh, templated accounts where we follow um, some pretty standard guidelines. So that helps tremendously. <laughs> so that's probably a requirement for using that kind of setup. Um, but we try to scrape it all out um, so that, uh, you know, if you're logged into the right account, you'll get the right settings. Interesting. And, and that's for every single cluster for you. Correct. Yeah. And in my opinion, this is when the open source projects start to, you know, uh, creating an ecosystem for DevOps, GitOps together. If you think about that service catalog or if, uh, service onboarding and you do something like Backstage, which is another open source project, you can actually have a centralized definition for your service. Like what is the name of the service? What is the URL endpoints in and out? Uh, where is going to be located? What kind of services? You, you know, you folks know about all those kind of things. We have like thousands of environments to define a service, right? Um, then you can actually automate it, as you just uh, suggested, Tracy. You can actually yeah. connect the Backstage API with your GitHub repository and say like, okay, this is a new service. I go to my you know, service onboarding portal, fill up everything one time, that's it. And then the pipelines in the back end actually query that API, get it, get it on all those key values and start running the pipeline to actually start the, uh, the deployments. I'm betting the catalog yep. business is going to do well. That's what we do. <laughs> I think the more we centralize data around the DevOps um, puzzle, the better off everybody's going to be. And you know, all these years we've never done that, which is kind of crazy. We've really never taken the data coming out of like a Jenkins pipeline and really started, you know, managing it and and using it uh, for actionable results. Right? We've just never done that. But now we have so much in this nonlinear complex world, the governance around this is 
a different story. And that's 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 a different um, panel discussion, Josh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Next time, next time. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. This was a pleasure. I really enjoyed picking your brain. It was fun for me. And uh, Josh, thank you for having me be the moderator. I enjoyed it. Yeah, just real quick before everybody jumps off, I will uh, just share our next event here. It's going to be in a couple of weeks. It's going to be with Todd, um, who is a GitOps expert, by the way. And uh, yeah, so we'll send out the recording uh, for this talk. And I just want to thank you, Tracy. Thank you so much for moderating this. It's such a pleasure to have you as always. And thank you to our speakers. And yeah, we'll be in touch. And for those of you who are not a part of our meetup, um, really invite you to join us there. And that's kind of the, the hub for this community. And we'll see you around. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Uh, all right. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you.